Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Apologies for the delay, but thank you so much again for joining us for another session of the We Connect Academy's Learning from Women Leaders Around the World series. My name is Sarah, and today I am very excited to introduce Paula Quincy. Paula is a relationship expert, TEDx speaker, and author of Self-Help Guides, Embracing Conflict and Embracing No. Her company, Atuid Communications, works with individuals and organizations to cultivate healthy relationships in both their personal and professional arenas by focusing on emotional skills, individual and team growth and development, organizational culture and dynamics. I will let Paula introduce herself and continue to talk a little bit more about the webinar today, but I would like to remind all attendees that you are in listen only mode. So if you have any questions throughout any point of the webinar, please write them down in the chat or Q&A boxes, and we will make sure to read them out loud once the webinar is complete. This really is a one chance opportunity to learn as much as possible since we have Paula live here today. So we very much encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. Again, you do not need to wait till the end. You can put your questions in at any point when it pops into your head. Uh, lastly, the recording of this webinar will be available after today's session and will be emailed to all attendees. It'll also be available on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, thank you so much, Paula, for being here with us today, and I will put it over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome, everybody. It's great to connect with so many people from around the world. I think it's such an amazing thing what technology can do these days and uh, quite appropriate for our webinar today in terms of who's teaching the robots. Uh, we, we often have been told that the robots are coming and the robots are going to take our jobs. And uh, But I'm sorry to say, or be the bearer of bad news, the robots are here already. And uh, so how, how do we live that uh, life of where we coexist with robots and what does it mean for us exactly in terms of our lives, our careers, our jobs and the workplace? So that's what we're going to be chatting about today. Great, so let's let's kick into it. Um, in today's world, uh, just trying to go to my next slide. There we go. Um, so I'm not sure if many of you have heard of the term VUCA and living in a VUCA world. Uh, basically, VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it's a, it's a very common buzzword that's being thrown around in the corporate world here in South Africa. But I personally believe that it is a, a, is a fancy buzzword for something that has been around for decades. And I call that life because life has uh, times where it feels volatile, times where it feels uncertain or complex or even ambiguous, whether that be in our personal worlds or in our professional worlds. Um, so, for example, when, you know, if you're having a fight or an argument with your partner, things can feel a little volatile and things can feel a little uncertain. And that can make us feel fearful and stressed and overwhelmed and sometimes not knowing how to cope and deal with situations. And especially with what's happening in today's working world, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we can't control, for example, uh, the currency, uh, exchange rate, rand, dollar, all of those kind of things, and how that affects us. And, um, you know, so many things are happening in the world from a, um, a volatility point of view. If you just think of the refugee situation, of Brexit, and all of those kind of things. And what that is doing to us from a business world, from a business perspective, business decisions, but also for our employees that work in our organizations. And so the need for talent to fulfill our roles is changing, particularly as uh, technology is changing and ever so quickly these days. I don't know if many of you can remember when you first received your mobile phone or handset, a couple of years ago, you had to charge it overnight first before you could use it. Whereas nowadays, you can take it straight out the box and you can start using it straight away. So that's one example of how life cycles are becoming shorter and shorter and how um, our worlds are changing and becoming much more fast paced. And a lot of times this feels 
this leaves people feeling overwhelmed by um, an ever-changing environment. And unfortunately, uh, one of the skills that we have to learn to develop is the, the ability to be flexible and adaptable on a daily basis, whether it be personal or professional, to, to survive and thrive in this ever-changing world. Uh, so for my next slide, um, not sure why it's not changing. There we go. So there are a lot of new emerging um, sectors that are coming out that we are seeing uh, that are creating a whole lot of new opportunities, particularly from a career path perspective, as well as from um, a skills development perspective. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, first of all, as individuals and as leaders, how are we developing our own skills to remain relevant in the workplace of the future? And then secondly, um, people that are reporting into us or people that we are managing and taking care of us uh, or taking care of, how are we developing them and giving them opportunities to develop their own skills and experience um, and knowledge to remain relevant in the workplace of the future? So, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, you may have gone and studied to be a chartered accountant and your career path may have been accounting, whereas today that is changing and it's now becoming one of a data scientist um, and learning how to interpret data and make meaningful um, insights from data and how we can apply those insights going forward in terms of our decision making processes on a day to day basis. So um, one of the, some of the new sectors that are coming about, um, virtual realities and augmented realities, um, 3D printing or 4D printing, for example. Um, I'm not sure if many of you uh, wear those devices that um, tell us when to eat and sleep and breathe and all of those kind of things. So uh, we are depending more and more on devices for um, decision making and, and living our lives on a daily basis. Uh, if you had gone to your parents a couple of years ago and said that you wanted to have a career as a blogger, I'm sure they would have looked at you with a very puzzled look on their face to say, well, what on earth is a blogger and how do you think you're going to make a living out of blogging? Um, so this is just, again, you know, some examples of how the world is changing, but also where some of the focus is going to be. So obviously technology is a big thing, but other big areas is the environment, particularly things like the, the global, um, the, the, uh, zone and environmental impact on the global system and that, uh, so water and electricity, uh, as well as from a, a human services perspective in terms of teaching. We no longer are teaching in terms of a classroom style teaching that we are familiar with. We're doing things exactly like we're doing now, online webinars, and it's also about places of convenience. We want to learn where we want to learn, when we want to learn, and how we want to learn. So it's access to teaching aids and um, environments and platforms. Mentoring is a big thing and also um, care of the elderly. And I'll touch on that some more in a little while um, as we go into more of these in more depth. So never before have we been in such a connected world through devices and platforms and technology, yet we are so disconnected disconnected from self as well as disconnected from others. In the personal space, particularly when it comes to marriages and relationships, technology is becoming a big problem in terms of the third person or the third energy in a relationship. So in other words, a lot of people or couples, because they are disconnected in their relationships, they are turning to platforms like social media whether it be Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, um, or chat, Snapchats on phones, it is another form of connection that I'm having with someone else that I'm not getting in my relationship. Um, and also because we are exposed to these different platforms where we can use emoticons or emojis to express our feelings, 
are we really conscious and aware of what we are saying or what we are really feeling when we use those emoticons or are we just using it because it's there and we can hide behind it because we are not able to really express or we don't want to express what we really think and feel for fear of uh, rejection, retaliation, or um, being ridiculed or being made fun of. So often we will hide behind these uh, funny faces, smiley faces, thumbs up, we'll like something, all those kind of things. Um, but do we really, are we really in tune with ourselves and what we're feeling on an emotional level? First of all, at an individual basis, in terms of ourselves, but then also are we in touch with the people around us? So in our personal worlds, our children and our families and our partners, and in the workplace, our leaders as well as our team members that we work with and that we spend majority of our time with. Are we really getting to know these people on a deeper level or is it purely just on a functional level? And what does that mean when it comes to relationships, building relationships and also communication and dealing with conflict in those two worlds? If we have to look at the job skills of the future, all the job skills of the future that are being predicted fall under what is commonly called the soft skills um, basket of skills. I actually like to call them real skills because it, it really takes, um, it's hard work to develop these skills. We don't get taught these skills in schools or universities. And we only really start interacting and becoming aware of and engaging with them when it comes to the workplace or in our personal relationships. So yes, while we might need to be learning new technology and how to um, deal or function on different platforms and stuff like that, the key skills that we actually need to be developing is what we call the soft skills or the people skills things around how to manage conflict, how to manage people, uh, the active listening, critical problem solving. And these are some of the skills that we will never ever be able to teach robots. Uh, robots will never ever be able to replace human compassion and human connection. And while we may be developing robots to fulfill certain functions in terms of automation when it comes to people and, and jobs and roles, they won't be able to connect on that deeper level, that emotional level. Um, and so as much as we are uh, developing skills and developing technology, robots will never ever be able to take that away from us, those skills. So the question is, what are you doing as an individual to develop these skills from a self point of view, from a leadership point of view, and then also your employees or your people in the workplace uh, that are working um, with you or underneath you or that you, are, you have an active role in terms of guiding their learning and their development. So the three common themes that are coming out really links back to the human touch. Coaching, and a big thing in the workplace these days is coaching and mentoring, whether it be through formal means or informal means. So I know for some companies that we work with, they have formal mentoring um, programs in place. Uh, other ways is through formal mentoring platforms. So for example, the National Mentoring Platform, We Connect is another platform where we can get access to mentors and learning and developing. But there's also informal ways of coaching and mentoring, um, for example, role models or trusted advisors and sources that we turn to. Um, caring in terms of people's health and wellness, and this is where employee wellness and well-being is taking on a huge big shift. Um, and realizing that um, the wellness days are not effective in terms of sustaining long-term health and well-being. One of the biggest or two of the biggest stresses that people struggle with on a daily basis is family and relationship stress and financial stress. A lot of people are not managing financially, um, which is putting a lot of stress on the family. And then that family stress combined with financial stress comes into the workplace and it affects people's performance and focus and productivity in the workplace. So a lot of employee wellness or employee assistance programs are re-looking 
what does health and wellness mean? How do we create an environment for our employees where they have access to this kind of support? And um, how are we able to sustain that over the longer term? So things, for example, like flexible working hours. Traditionally, companies used to look at the, the the nine to five or come in at six and leave at three or come in at nine and leave at seven as a means of flexi hours, but that's not the case anymore. Uh, through technology, we're looking at uh, ways of working from home or remotely, uh, especially companies becoming more and more global and having remote teams. How do we maintain the um, human connection with remote teams? Uh, in terms of common vision, common goals, and a culture that cultivates uh, a sense of bonding and connection and all being on the same team and the same side and working towards the same goals. And then again, connecting through man and machine in terms of, as I said, platforms and technology that allows us to connect with others, but how do we keep it on a much more human and real level, particularly when it comes to um, ethics? And uh, if we just look at some of the big factors that have happened in corporate, uh, for example, Steinhoff, um, KPMG, and all of those companies that have recently been found out of doing unethical practices, it's becoming a big thing in corporates where employees, particularly the millennial generation, want to work for employees or organizations where there is trust and transparency and ethical um, guidelines and governance. So ultimately, as humans, no matter how much technology or robots are going to be there, we are always going to want or need the human touch because we are social creatures by nature. What this means then in terms of the workplace is that we have to re-evaluate the employment life cycle because no longer are we having people that are working within an organization and having a career path that spans 10, 20, 30 years of loyalty in one organization, particularly with millennial and now the centennials that are coming through the workplace. You're lucky if you keep them engaged in your organization for two to between two to five years, because for them, it's all about wanting to experience life and they are looking for organizations that give them opportunities on how to experience life and work in a way that works for them. So providing the right access to technologies and platforms, simple things like Wi-Fi is a given, but online platforms and technologies, because they are used to that kind of world and being connected in that kind of world. However, on the other side of that, Often what we're finding or seeing is that they are losing the ability when it comes to real social skills. For example, managing and dealing with conflict and conflict can be a number of things. It can be a simply a difference of opinions, a different viewpoints, different decisions, different ideas, and that whole diversity that comes with it. So how do we manage diversity in the workplace? Um, and diversity, again, not just being a gender diversity or a cultural diversity, but it's all kinds of diversity. It's technology, it's platforms, it's people, it's ideas, it's environments, uh, all of those things, which gives them a sense of we are experiencing life to the fullest. So what we need to start looking at is the different life stages in the employment life cycle and where and how we can upskill or reskill people to remain relevant in the, in the workplace of the future, understanding that it is going to be an ever constantly changing environment. What role does technology play? And then where can we redeploy or reuse people to come back into the system and bring their knowledge and their skills with them. So an example would be um, from a company policy perspective, people are generally expected to retire anything from age 50, 55 or 60 and upwards. How do we bring those people back into the system, whether it be through a formal or informal mentoring or consulting perspective? to share their skills and their knowledge with the junior, younger, middle management 
to um, share and build the knowledge of the organization um, that they have and imparting that with the new people in the organization. If we have to look at what some of the jobs of the future are that are being predicted at the moment, um, in terms of the list on the screen, the very first one being a body part maker. When I first saw that, I had pictures and images of we were going to be dealing with body parts on the black market, like we may have often heard stories about in the past where you know people were selling kidneys and all sorts of body parts in the black market. But I'm happy to say that it is not that at all. It's actually to do with technology in terms of robotic body parts. For example, robotic limbs, um, robotic hands, and this is to do with people that have lost body parts or have needed to replace body parts because of certain situations. For example, um, it could have been war veterans, it could be uh, motor vehicle accidents, it could be dreaded disease, for example, diabetes. So you won't be studying to be a generic surgeon as you have been up until now. You'll be studying potentially to be a body part maker in terms of robotic body parts. There's a big focus on genetically modified farming, particularly because of the volume of and demand from the world when it comes to food and food sources. And we know that that is quite a big issue now. And we can see that with a big sort of drive or conscious awareness in terms of going back to organic or wholesome food or even um, plant-based diets. An elderly wellness consultant um, was also quite surprising and interesting for me, but when we look at science and technology, and science is predicting that the first person to live to be 150 years old has already been born, People are living longer and longer, and therefore um, you still have another lifespan after you've left the corporate world. So let's say hypothetically you've left corporate world at age 60, you still have another 20 to 30, potentially even 50, 60 years ahead of you that you will be living. And unfortunately, robots will not be able to look after the elderly people. Um, in the way that elderly caregivers or wellness consultants will be able to. There has also been an upsurge in terms of retirement villages or retirement homes um, and also end of life caregivers. So that's another job landscape that's opening. With age um, improving in terms of us living longer, one of the other jobs will be in memory augmentation surgeons. In other words, how do we capture our memories? If you think of things like dementia and Alzheimer's, how do we capture people's memories um, and almost re-implant it as we grow older and older and live longer and longer because our memory will be fading? And with that comes a whole new um, world when it comes to being ethical. And one of those jobs will be a new science ethicist in terms of what is the fine line between what is ethical and unethical when it comes to science. Um, for example, um, cloning. And um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the first um, human head transplant has already been done. Uh, it, there are two stories. If you look on the internet, the one is in South Africa and the one is in Russia. The South African one is fake news. The Russian one is a true story. And they did the, the head transplant of a human onto a chimpanzee's body. Um, and they already have a person who has volunteered to be the first live human head transplant. Um, and this person has volunteered because, if I recall correctly, they suffer from MLS. And so basically their body is of no use to them, but they're still fully functional when it comes to uh, brain and intellect and mind. And so they have um, volunteered to be the first person to get a new body. Uh, space pilots, tour guides and architects with all the Tesla and all of those news about flying to the moon and stuff. Uh, we know will no longer be putting tour guides and tour packages together for Earth. It will also be in terms of space and whatever is happening up there in that new world. 
Vertical farming is another big one because we're running out of space in terms of uh, places are becoming more and more populated. So we are running out of open land and open ground to farm, whether it be maize or crops or even um, herds, for example, cattle and sheep and stuff like that. So there's a big drive in terms of vertical farming and making use of space upwards. And if you just Google vertical farming, you'll see a whole range of pictures and images of what vertical farming uh, is starting to look like. The other big thing in terms of uh, climate and the impact on the environment is a climate change reversal specialist. Uh, the focus or, or sort of bet seems to be that China may solve this problem and fixing the ozone layer and fixing our energy shortages, whether it be water or food sources or the impact of the ozone layer um, will be another big finding when it comes to science. Um, and with us living in such a global world and uh, traveling uh, much more globally than what we used to, all the superbugs that are being passed around, for example, um, swine flu, bird flu, um, Ebola, all of those kind of things. So one of the jobs will be a quarantine enforcer in terms of how do we quarantine and keep these bugs and superbugs from, from spreading to the rest of the world. And because we're living in a virtual world um, and we're living in a global and an online world, no longer will it be about the laws of your own country. It will be understanding what the laws of the virtual world mean and what is the impact when it comes to IP and who owns what and which laws govern who and whom and what that means in terms of roles and responsibilities and consequences. So when it comes to learning, it's we need to look at the new ways of learning and how we integrate learning into the way that the world is moving. Uh, global learning platforms, so mobile, multimedia, and what we call immersive experiences. So here in South Africa, what some of the business uh, colleges or business schools are doing is they have what they call immersion days where they take um, students, whether it be MBA students or students on leadership programs, and they actually immerse them into actual situations. So it's about on the job learning and um, experiencing firsthand what a situation or a solution or a technology um, looks like. Uh, city formats with communities and living in cities, so apartment and high-rise living. It's how do we learn in our environments. Um, so, for example, uh, apartment buildings are becoming communities of their own. How do we share our resources? How do we share our skills? And how do we leverage and uplift each other within our communities? So thinking about things like recycling, for example. And then communities of practice uh, linking to city formats is how do we come together and share practices amongst ourselves and transfer those skills in particular areas of interests and or support to each other. So as I mentioned, in terms of the top jobs, these are the key ones that have been identified as the ones to look out for. I've already touched on a few of them. So the old age wellness consultant, vertical farming. Nanomedic is around age reversal. So ladies on the line, um, if you think about when you go to your local department store, there's, where there is this huge array and selection of potions and lotions and serums that we can use and we can now co-create our own um, formula by going in and choosing the serums and potions that we want based on our lifestyle needs and our skin type and all of those things. So age reversing, climate change we've spoken about, um, new scientists, ethicists we've spoken about, a security repair person. So up until now, we would have called in um, someone to repair in terms of plumbing or electrical uh, or anything along those lines. Whereas with the new smart devices, so for example, our smart washing machines, our smart coffee machines, our smart fridges that are now being um, produced, 
and in our homes, we no longer will be calling a plumber or an electrician. We will be calling in a security repair person who will be using technology to repair our home devices as well as our devices in um, the workplace. Personal productivity person is actually going to replace what is commonly known as a personal assistant or a secretary or a PA. And that's because we are being inundated with thousands and thousands of data and information from all sorts of different sources that um, it can be overwhelming. If you just think about your inbox and how many emails you get on a daily basis that you have to sift through and work through. So a personal productivity person will be the person that will be doing the sifting through all the information, sorting it out and um, streamlining it towards you in terms of what is the stuff that you need to be focusing on, the information and the data, in order to um, perform and be productive and um, helping you understand and find your way through this inundated mountain of information that we are constantly being bombarded with. So what does that mean for us as leaders in the future? And I very respectfully use leader in the loosest sense. I personally don't believe that you need a fancy job title to be a leader. I believe that leadership comes from within, just like change comes from within. So for example, in your personal world, if you happen to be a single parent, so a single mother or father, and you are raising your children, you are leading the way, you are paving the way for your children. If you are volunteering in your community, whether it be through your church or a charity or a welfare or an organization, you are leading, you are paving the way, you are taking initiative, you are taking charge. And the same in the workplace, whether you have the title of manager or supervisor or leader, or whether you are in a team and you are simply put in charge of a particular task or role or deliverable, you are leading. So how do we lead going forward? And it's all about the big C's. How do you connect in terms of building the relationships that are seen as authentic and sincere and genuine? Um, how are you keeping people um, challenged and engaged and stimulated in the workplace? Providing clarity on exactly what is expected from who and by when and how and empowering the people to deliver on what their tasks and roles and responsibilities are. Building a environment of collaboration, so trust. And sometimes collaboration is not only about collaborating with your own team and your own team members. It's also about cross-functional teams or working streams or global working streams. And even now, particularly when it comes to small businesses, it's about how do you even potentially collaborate with your competitors? Because you each bring something different and unique to the table, but collectively when you combine or collaborate your offerings, it creates a much more impactful and empowerful offering to a potential client. Credibility is not only through your company and what your company stands for, it's also about your personal brand. It's how you behave both in and outside of the workplace. And unfortunately or fortunately with social media these days, you never know who is taking snapping pictures or video clips of you and posting them on, on social media. And the minute it goes viral, viral and online, it already talks to your credibility and your personal brand. And that's both in your personal world as well as in the workplace. So thinking about your circles of influence, they say that we become the collective sum of the five people that we spend most of our time with. So if you think about who you spend most of your time with in your personal space and in the workplace, what is that saying about you in terms of being branded by association? Who are you influencing and, are, and how are they influencing you? And is it a positive or a negative? Okay. Talking about um, conveying feedback, a lot of the time we see feedback as criticism. How do we create a culture and an environment where it is constructive feedback that is done in a way that is, it's okay to make mistakes, but it's a way of learning and it's a way of developing and upskilling ourselves. 
um, and how do we recognize and reward work that is well done? Um, a lot of the time we take it, uh, we're very quick to point out when people are not delivering or not performing, but when do we uh, recognize and acknowledge work well done? Simple things such as going the extra mile, spending overtime, sacrificing personal time, etc. Confidence, particularly in a world that is so uncertain and volatile, um, where we don't know what the future holds, how can we have our own sense of confidence, but also how do we build the confidence of the people around us and the workplace itself? Showing um, people how their particular contribution contributes to the overall goals of the workplace and allowing people the ability to have control over how they work. So in other words, managing their own time, the way that they do things versus how we want them to do things. In other words, if the outcome and the end result is the same, does it matter whether they did it your way or their way? So how do you empower people to go out and take initiative and be proactive and do things that delivers the end result? And this is where we need to start learning to measure output and not hours at the desk, as we traditionally have done up until now. So one example would be um, Richard Branson in the Virgin Group. He gave all his employees unlimited leave. And at the time when this was announced, people thought that his employees would now um, uh, abuse the system and they would never be at work and they would forever be taking leave. But after about six months or so, when they went in and interviewed their employees, the feedback from the employees was that they felt like they were now being treated as adults, that they were in charge of their own time and they could manage their own time. And this allowed them to be a little bit more flexible in terms of when and where they took leave. And they felt like that they were now trusted. And as a result of that, they actually found that people were taking less leave than what they were in the, few, in the past. So how do we create happy employees? Because happy employees equals engaged employees, which is ultimately productive employees. And that results in the bottom line when it comes to our organizations, irrespective of how big or small it may be. So we need to look at from a human psyche point of view in terms of the willingness to change. First of all, starting with developing self-awareness, and this is the same as emotional intelligence, and why it's so critical and important as an individual and a leader, we develop it within ourselves, but also we help our people develop it as well. So having the ability or the awareness to change, the desire to change, so understanding what's in it for me and how I do I benefit as a result of this behavior, giving them the knowledge and the ability to change, so knowing how to, so helping them implement goals um, and um, healthy coping mechanisms as opposed to what a lot of people do is they turn to negative coping mechanisms when they are feeling stressed and anxious and on the verge of burnout. So some, some negative coping mechanisms are things like, so for example, substance abuse, which can be anything from alcohol to painkillers or pain medication to um, antidepressants, um, emotional eating, etc. And then how do we help them sustain that from a lifestyle point of view, not only in the workplace, but also at home? So in other words, that whole work-life balance perspective of which actually it's a myth, there is no such thing as work-life balance, it's about work-life integration. And helping um, individuals, employees and ourselves find a balance that works for us and our lifestyle and the life stage that we are at in the here and the now. Understanding that it is a flexible and adaptable situation and that it will change as our environment changes because we often conform to our environment and what is happening in our environment. So how do we take all of this into account when it comes to automation and robots and um, understanding the impact of robots and technology in terms of personal health and well-being? And how do we find a way to marry the two together? 
So when it comes to individuals or teams and organizational development, we need to understand the individuals in the room and who we are working with by understanding what their strengths are and what their development areas are. And this is where a lot of organizations are turning to assessments and assessment tools to help them on a deeper level understand an individual um, and where their strengths lie, what happens when you overuse your strengths, that it can work against you as a negative, and then how you put a development plan in place to help these individuals develop themselves going forward. It's the same when we look at job fit and job matching. And again, I say this respectfully, but when it comes to job specs or job um, uh, blueprints, we often um, look at, or job specs are often glorified to-do lists. It's a task oriented format. We need to look at what is the behavior that this job or this role requires, and are we recruiting the right person with the right behavior competencies that will be a good fit for this job? Same with the leadership style. Often we find that there are what is called personality clashes or leadership clashes, and that's because we don't understand each other's behavior competencies and leadership styles. And if we can help individuals understand that about each other, we can help develop better leadership styles and better leadership relationships between leaders and their reportees. And from a team dynamics perspective, if we can help teams understand where their collective strengths are, where their collective development areas are, we can even now go down and drill to an individual level where we can understand where the differences can cause conflict in teams, but also where we can um, partner individuals up into specific working teams or working streams because of their collective strengths and how they add value to each other and the team as a collective whole. Also from an employee well-being, how are we measuring and tracking employee wellness and well-being? Traditionally, a lot of organizations have done or performed annual wellness days where organizations come in and measure things such as blood pressure and cholesterol levels and um, a BMI, body mass indicators. But thereafter, there is no follow through or sustainability or follow up in terms of what the findings have been. So how do we track and monitor people and in the organization from an employee wellness and well-being perspective and the stress indicators and understand whether it is personal issues that are being brought to the workplace that is affecting work performance or is it work pressure that is being taken home and it is affecting the home life. So when it comes to keeping our employees, the key thing is about keeping them engaged, keeping them stimulated and keeping them challenged. And there's a number of ways that we can do that. And unfortunately, money is not the only way, but often the perception is, is that money solves everything. And that's not true because people are going through different life stages and they have different needs. So a younger person may very well be um, in the, in the, um, wanting to be ambitious and career driven and all of those things and they may be looking for promotions where someone that is much more um, older or in a much more later life stage, for example, empty nesters, for them it's about quality of life in terms of living life, taking time off, going away, etc. So we need to look at our recognition and reward systems in our organizations and what behavior is it driving when it comes to rewarding and recognizing people in the workplace because people will behave in a way that is being rewarded. And so just to um, kind of end off, we need to stop calling it the future of work or the fourth industrial revolution because the robots are here. It is an ongoing changing process. We don't know what the future holds. Um, we cannot keep saying that the robots are going to take our jobs because that is not necessarily true. It may automate a number of job functions, but at the same time, it will open up 
a lot more opportunities as we move into new spheres and new um, spectrums when it comes to different um, technologies and spheres. So how do we build trust um, in our businesses, in our society, in our communities? How do we rem remain relevant through ongoing learning? How do we focus on building the mental and emotional well-being of our people? Because that in turn will build resilience and resilience can help overcome change and uncertainty. And how do we move from the IQ to EQ to what we ultimately need, which is the WeQ? In other words, we are in this together. We are a collective. How do we leverage each other's strengths, skill sets, knowledge, um, and create a culture of um, learning and support and trust uh, in, in the workplace? Because that will ultimately get taken home into the home space as well. And so I just wanted to leave you with some questions and food for thought that you can maybe think about from your own perspective or take it back into your teams. What is unique about you and your team? What do you think your development edge is? What do you think you need to walk away with today to be effective in your field or where your field is going to in terms of emerging markets? What do we as a team co-create today that will create the most value for our organization? And what is what can this team uniquely do together that they cannot do a part that the world of tomorrow needs? Because your culture is ultimately going to be one of your competitive advantages going forward as the world and the piece of the pie gets smaller and smaller and, and markets get more and more competitive. How do you differentiate and how do you remain relevant? And uh, ultimately, we decide where we are going and that it's unfortunately not money that makes the world go round, it's relationships that make the world go round. And how are we building a healthy relationship with ourselves, but also in our personal and our professional worlds? And yeah, I hope that that has given you some food for thought to take away with you and some ideas of where and how uh, potentially the world is moving for you and where you could potentially look at um, creating some value. And yeah, and to thank you for your time and I'm not sure if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I do have one question. So just as a note, if any of you guys had anything that you wanted to mention throughout this awesome presentation, please feel free to ask your questions now. While this will be uh, recorded and the link will be sent to you, this is the one time that we have Paula here to actually um, be live with us. So there is one question, Paula, about employees. So hold on, let me just bring this up. Okay, so it says, in a world where we need to start training ourselves to be less like robots or take on skills that robots don't have, how do we ensure that our current staff are also having those skills? Is that something that we need to invest in as an employer or a company owner? Absolutely. And there's so many options available to us now that we've never had before. For example, you don't you no longer have to go to traditional learning environments like university or colleges. There's so much access to resources online, for example, Teachable, Udemy, etc. A lot of institutions are also offering online learning, um, not only long learning programs, for example, degrees, but also short courses. Um, which would be a great way to incentivize employees. Um, also giving them the freedom to choose what they would like to study. Um, so helping them find a balance between personal interests, but also professional development um, that keeps them stimulated and engaged. And watching the trends of what is happening in your environment, um, either what your competitors are doing or what research and trends are showing us. So are you following the trends of your markets and your industry? Great, thank you, Paula. I don't think we have any other questions, but um, before we kind of wrap up, Paula, do you have a slide that potentially has your contact information? If anyone has any follow-up questions they want to reach back out to you for? Yes, absolutely, I do have. Um, it will be on my next slide. 
which if I can just get it to move. There we go. Those are my contact details um, and I'm on all the social media platforms as well. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and also obviously my website, but you're welcome to get in touch with me um, in any way that feels comfortable for you. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Thank you again so much, Paula. I think that gave everyone a lot to think about. So as Paula mentioned, please feel free to follow up. Um, and as I have said before, the link to this webinar will be emailed to all of the attendees later on this evening. So Paula, thank you so much again for giving us your time and all of your expertise. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope to hear from you again in our next webinar. Have a good morning or afternoon, depending where you are in the world. Thank you so much and yeah, have a good day everybody. Thank you.